Good morning. I hope everybody had a chance to uh, read the scriptures. We're studying the book of Romans. Romans is a very difficult book. I was talking to my son on the phone last night and he asked me, he said, what are you preaching on in the morning? I said, well, we're preaching on the book of Romans. And he goes, okay, so you're gonna do that all of 2021 I said no I'm going to do it in four lessons he said I don't believe it <laughs> he said you can't do Romans in four lessons but we're going to give it a shot anyway and I do hope you had a chance to read uh, those scriptures you know one of the biggest questions of all time I think is why did God send his son why did he send Jesus to die for our sins why do you think this is? Why do you think he did that? You know, I think that you probably would say, well, I know the answer to that. That's really a silly question. Even though you might think that you know the answer, I think that you will find that the truth is kind of disturbing. In our first lesson on Romans, we talked about an introduction, a Paul's letter to the Romans, in verses one, in chapter one, verses one through 17. This morning, we're gonna to turn to Romans, and I'd like for you to do that now, to Romans chapter one. And we will begin in verse 18 this morning and go all the way through to chapter three and verse 20, talking about some of those particular scriptures. The question is, I think that we wrestle with, is why the need for salvation. And I think that the first thing that we need to realize is that we are without excuse. We are without an excuse. Paul really gives his version of the history of the world or the history as to how sin entered into the world. If you look at Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 20, God's wrath on unrighteousness. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness because what? may be known of God is manifest in them. For God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. I think he made it pretty plain that people are without excuse. If you look at Romans chapter 1, verses 24 through 30, therefore God also gave them up to, what? Uncleanliness in the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever amen for this reason god gave them up to vile passions for even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature likewise also the men leaving the natural use of the woman burned in their lust for one another, men with men committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error, which was due. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting, being filled with all unrighteousness, 
sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil. They are whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil, things disobedient to parents. Verse 24 gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts. Gave them over to the sinful desires in their hearts. Verse 28 if you look at it, they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God. They gave up on living for God and lived for themselves. They gave up on living for God and they lived for themselves. Verses 20 through 30, they have become filled with vices. Brethren, have you ever thought about this? If you look at these particular groups of scriptures, you have all kinds of sins that are listed. From lies to sexual immorality, all kinds of things. And you know what? We as human beings, we try to look at sins as what? We've got murder, that's really bad. If you commit adultery or fornication, that's really bad. But, you know, a little white lie, what about that? We kind of separate sins as this is really bad and this is not so bad. But what he's trying to get across to us is what? Sin, sin. Doesn't make any difference if it's a little white lie or it's murder, it's sin. And what does sin do for us? It separates us from God. But it goes on a little bit further than that because it shows that we as human beings we like to do our own desires and what we think is right. And sometimes we push the knowledge of God aside. If you go on into verses 31 and 32, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who knowing the righteous judgment of God that those who practice such things are deserving of death. Not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. And then isn't it interesting? Because what's God's response to that? Because at the same time as we classify sins, what do we also do? Do we not also judge others? Do we decide that, you know, hey, Look over there, I'm, I'm better than old Joe is. I'm better than Mark or whoever. We kind of look at that and say, look at the awful things that they've done. You know, I'm not quite that bad. And he had an answer for that. Because he talks about Gentiles or sinners. Why do you think Paul particularly did that when he started talking about and trying to impose that Gentiles are sinners? Paul sets this up because there were who was listening to him. They were Jews. They were listening to them. And, you know, if you were a non-Jew, you were a sinner. There was a sense of religious superiority that Jews were better than everyone else. Since God had called them to be a nation before all nations. Isn't there a risk? though that when you and I become like the Jews, superior to non-believers, because we have some inside knowledge of God and they don't? Well, if you look at Romans chapter 2, verses 5 through 11, he tells us, but in accordance with your hardness and your impotent heart, you are treasuring up for yourselves wrath in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God who will render to each one according to his deeds eternal life to those who by patient continuing in doing good seek for glory, honor, and immortality. But to those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth but obey unrighteousness 
indignation, wrath, tribulation, and anguish on every soul of man who does evil of the Jew first and also the Greek. But glory, honor, and peace to everyone who works what is good to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Here's, here's the clue right here. For there is no partiality with God. God does not show favoritism. It doesn't really matter who you are, what race you're from, or anything else. God does not show favoritism. You know, I read a story, which is a true story, which involved the Church of Christ. There was a young man who was an undercover narcotics officer in Houston, Texas. He worked diligently with the youth of a congregation in Houston. Spent a lot of hours working with the youth minister and trying to help these young people to raise up or to rise up in their growth as a true Christian. He became quite popular as a speaker. He was asked to come speak at a congregation and as you can imagine, him being an undercover narcotics agent, he rode a motorcycle, he had a black leather jacket, he had long hair, scruffy looking beard. You know, he's the kind of guy that if he sits down on the pew, you sit on the other end or you sit three seats back. He showed up at that congregation and got there ahead of time and he went in and he sat down on the back seat and members became to come in. Nobody spoke to him. Finally, a gentleman walked over and tapped him on the shoulder and he said, Sir, I'm not really trying to be rude, but I would like you to know that we don't really like your kind here. The young man stood up and he said, Well, sir, who are you? And he said, Well, I'm an elder of the congregation here. He reached in his pocket and he said, Well, I guess you'd like to have this check back that you sent me to come here and speak to your youth. Brethren, we make judgments on people, and there's some implication here because to imply explicitly, as Paul does, that Jews are equally classed as sinners is at first scandalous because they thought they were extremely superior to everybody. However, Paul recognizes that religious rule making leads to us playing God. That religious rulemaking leads us to playing God. Ultimately, judging has to do with playing God. When we judge someone, we do three things. First, we place ourselves above another as if we were his or her God. Second, we condemn another. And third, we create the standard for another. When we evaluate someone, we don't do these three things. I hope and pray that we do not. First, what do we do? We do not place ourselves above other person. Instead, we identify with that person as a fellow sinner and struggler, humbling ourselves as we realize that we are subject to temptation also. In Galatians chapter 6 and verse 1, Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourselves lest you also be tempted. Second, we do not condemn another person with the guilt and the shame and the wrath of the law. We are sinners, are just as guilty and do not have that privilege. In Romans chapter 2 and verse 3. And do you think this, O man, you who judge those practicing such things and doing the same, that you will escape the judgment of God? Third, we do not make up the standard. We humbly bow to God's standard in evaluating each other and call each other to repentance. 
Henry Cloud and John Townsend, they wrote a book, and it was entitled How People Grow. What the Bible reveals about personal growth. I took some words from pages 53 and 54 of that particular book, and it says, we cannot be left to make up the standards. For what reason? Because we would either make them too hard or too soft. Therefore, all people are sinners. Only solution that's left is no one person is truly righteous other than God. If you look at Romans chapter 3 and verse 9, what then? Are we better than they? Not at all. For we have previously charged both Jews and Greeks that they are all under sin. So why do we have God's law? Why is it there? Why do we have his word? Romans chapter 3 verses 19 through 20, I think answers that question. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. It's there so that we can become conscious of sin. And so how do we answer the question? Why did God send his son, Jesus Christ, to this earth? Because no other person was good enough. Only he was sinless and dedicated to loving his father and carrying out his father's will. And brethren, I want to close with just a few statements because I think here is the gospel. And I think you need to think about this one statement. You're more sinful than you ever dared believe but you're more loved than you ever hoped. Because if you think about it, regardless of who we are or where we came from, what our statue is in life and how great and notable we are, it doesn't matter because God has no favoritism. And we're all sinners. And if it wasn't for his great love for us, there would be no salvation. He was willing to send his son to die on a cross for people who at that time were sinners and are still sinners and will be even to the day we die. But he gives us a hope and a promise if we keep his covenants and his commands, we strive hard to live a Christian life, to honor and to glorify him, and to also realize as we look around in this world and and particularly today, we have a pandemic going on. We have a lot of civil unrest. And we classify people we should not judge and realize as you look at these individuals, they have a soul. They're created in the image and the likeness of God. Regardless of who they are, and they all deserve God's love. And they have his love. But there's a big but there. We have to confess his name and follow his commands be buried in baptism and raised to walk in the newness of life. If you've not done that, today would be a great day to do that. But also, if you're here and you've turned away from him, it'd be a good time to come back, to ask for his forgiveness, to let us pray with you and for you, and to take up our places, brethren, in our world, caring and understanding of others realizing that there's not really one that's better than the other. They're just all different types of sin, but remember, sin is sin. Sin is sin, and sin separates us from God. And you and I as Christians have an opportunity to spread God's word. If you have need of the gospel invitation, won't you come while together we stand and sing. The Lord in the light of his word what a glory he stands.
lights all our way.